Get then started. you're always talking more than everybody else. <laughs> hey, Anne. Donna, are you in, Hi, are everybody. You in else and Hi, Cut. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you in California? I'm in California. My name is Zen Honeycutt. I'm the founding executive director of Moms Across America, and we're recording this Moms Connect call. It's Monday night, and I don't remember the date, but it's in May, the week, <laughs> week before Memorial Day. <laughs> it's a Monday is all I know. The 18th. Thank you, Susie. And uh, we have moms and mothers and others on from all across the country tonight. We have some extremely important news about uh, GMOs that we're going to cover. So I will be talking a little bit more um, about GMOs tonight than anything else. But if there is anybody with important news about 5G or health freedom, we also cover those topics um, very seriously as well. So uh, I'm going to start screen sharing and I'm going to share um, an image of the actual document that we're going to talk about, but then I'm going to switch over to some of the points that um, I have pulled out of this 49 page document, which I received um, on Monday. And I'm gonna mute a few people if that's okay, just so that there isn't background noise. Um, but if you have something that you wanna say, please don't take being muted as an offense, just um, you know, raise your hand or put something in the chat box and I'll unmute you, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so what the, the scenario is, is that on, um, Saturday, I got a notification directly from the USDA notifying um, me, I think because I asked for a notification when I filled out the comments um, about the ruling. So a couple of months ago, you'll, you'll probably remember the USDA put out a, a, a policy change that they would possibly allow GMO companies and developers to regulate themselves to basically say whether or not their, their uh, GMO needed to be regulated. So I'm gonna read the summary here just so that you get the whole gist of like their exact wordings. And then I'm gonna give you 13 points that I pulled out from these 49 pages, which took me pretty much, not to like sound like a martyr or whatever to read, but it took me pretty much all day because the wording is so complicated and, um, and there's so many issues to cover that it, it really does take a lot of time. They said they only received 203 comments on this proposal during the comment period, but Friends of the Earth said that there were over 6,900 comments. Um, but they did, they did respond to, I mean, I didn't see maybe 203, but they lumped some of the comments together. But they responded very thoroughly, I believe, to many of the topics and um, they just responded 21 times with, we don't agree. And the majority of those were asking for more regulation. So here's the summary of this. And then APHIS is Animal and Plant Health Inspection <laughs> Service. And this is a part of the um, USDA. So Sarah, did you wanna say something? Did you have a question? No, okay, all right. Um, so the summary is we are amending the regulations regarding the movement, which is importation, interstate movement, and environmental release of certain genetically engineered organisms in response to advances in genetic engineering and our understanding of the plant pest risk posed by genetically engineered organisms, thereby reducing the regulatory burden for developers of organisms that are unlikely to pose plant pest risks. This final rule, which marks the first comprehensive revision of the regulations since they were established in 1987, provides a clear, predictable, and efficient regulatory pathway for innovators facilitating the development of genetically engineered organ organisms that are unlikely to pose plant pest risks. Now, I'm gonna, I need to say a few points about this, which is number one, they're regulating for the movement, importation, interstate movement, and environmental release, release of certain genetically engineered organism, organism, organisms, I'd like to point out that their job, according to the FDA, is in this first uh, paragraph right here, they oversee the agricultural and environmental safety of planting and field testing of genetically engineered plants. Environmental safety, right, of in planting and field testing. It, it doesn't just say movement. So there is nothing to do about health and safety in, in their regulation. I just want to point that out. Nothing to do 
with health and safety. It's only to do with the movement. And then the other thing that they are, um, that they're pointing out is that it's all about plant pest risk. And a plant pest risk is basically it's weediness. And weediness means, is it gonna grow and crowd out other plants and become an agriculture, agricultural detriment to the farmer, right? Is it gonna spread and become a weed? That's the only thing that they're regulating for. They're not regulating for the impact of the GMO on our health or on our safety or on pollinators or other beneficial pests, right? They don't regulate for that. So um, very, very important to note. So I'm gonna go through some of the 13 um, points. If you don't mind, actually, I'm just, I'm gonna look at the document and then I'll get back to it and I'll, sh I'll share it with you later because otherwise everybody's gonna be reading it and it's gonna be, um, I think, confusing. Um, the first one, is that the, well, no, actually, I'll, I'll share it. It's fine. I, just, I just need to do both at the same time. The first one is that the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, will only regulate GMOs for the plant pest risk, which I just explained, weediness and for movement, and health environmental impacts are not being considered because um, they see no reason to. And the second one is the genetic manipulation of RNAi, CRISPR, or any gene editing will not be regulated. Off-target mutations from gene editing will not be considered. Only DNA genetic engineering. And even then, it's voluntary. So guys, this is really, really bad because RNA and CRISPR is like the new wave, right, of GMOs, and they genetically engineer the RNA and um, and and these promoters and silencers on either end of the information which goes into the RNA can either wake genes up or it can silence genes. And we don't know if that's going to happen to our child's ability to process vitamin D or, <laughs> you know, to support its metabolism or whatever. We don't know what these promoters are going to do in our children's bodies. We also don't know uh, what CRISPR is going to do with, you know, editing out a part of the RNA um, and or whether it's going to impact, I mean, we know that gene editing can impact multi-generations, multi, multiple generations, and we don't know what that's going to do out in the wild, right? Or if it's, or if we eat it, or if an animal eats it. It's unpredictable and uncontrollable and um, and is a really bad idea to not be regulated. Um, if anybody has anything they want to say or chime in, make sure to unmute yourself and, and you can do that. Number three, the entire process to apply for exclusion from regulation or to report a GMO for regulation is voluntary. All completely voluntary. Number Four, any genetic engineering genes that are currently in the gene pool are exempt from any regulations. And that includes existing genes from unrelated species of current GMO to create a new GMO. So it just needs to be in the plant's gene pool. Um, however, if it's already in a GMO plant's gene pool, right, and it's a different uh, species, my understanding is that, that can still, it can still stay. Um, and if, and if, by the way, there's a related species, like if it's a different type of apple that was a GMO before, you don't have to get permission to do the same thing to a, a diff, another type of apple, of apple, right? It's already just all lumped together, all lumped together in um, and considered approved. The entire process to apply from, um, oh, I already said that one, sorry. Um, so number six, APHIS is clear that the intention of the updated regulations allows the market to drive the demand for new plants and reduce costs, which could hamper innovation. So they're really clear in putting out this document that this document is not to regulate and protect for the health and safety of GMOs. That's not their intention at all. Their intention is to drive the market to create new GMO plants and to um, reduce the costs that hamper innovation. At least they're honest about it, I guess you could say, right? 
number seven, for those companies that do choose to apply for an exemption of the GME plant, no field test or experimental data is required. So you can submit whatever you want and say this plant doesn't need to be regulated because it's not harmful to the environment or it's not a plant, well, they don't, actually they don't care about harmful to the environment. It's not a plant pest risk and uh, so it doesn't need to be regulated and yet you don't need to supply any experimental data to show what to back up what you're saying. It's completely unscientific. Okay, number eight, plant, plant made pharmaceutical or industrial chemical producing plants shall only be regulated by permits for movement. No regulation of the safety or contamination risk of these plants, which contain pharmaceuticals or chemicals like insulin or growth hormones, will be conducted. And if you look up that word, plant made pharmaceutical industrial chemical PMPIs, you'll see that there are GMO plants that are already being created with growth hormones in them to counter dwarfism and to make people who are short grow. So just imagine if rats start eating these plants, right? Or certain birds or, you know, pests. I mean, what happens if the wrong species starts eating these growth hormone plants? Or human beings start eating them that don't need to be eating them, right? Or our children start eating them. Are they, they going to go through puberty at, at four years old? I mean, what happens to these, pe the people that eat these plants? Well, they don't care because they're not regulating it. They're only regulating based on movement. Now, I believe that this is why Monsanto spent, I believe, $5 million on building greenhouses. And do you remember going to the Monsanto shareholder meeting and seeing the greenhouses that they built? Yes, yes, I do. You remember that? I'm wondering about that. I think that's because they knew that they were going to have to get permits or they were already maybe at the time having get permits for moving them. And so they didn't want to have to move the GMOs from Hawaii, which is where many of their, um, you know, their test plots are to the Monsanto, to the Monsanto um, head offices where the scientists are, or many of the scientists are, um, because then they would have to apply for a permit. They would have to admit what they're doing. They would have to be upfront with the government about what they're doing. So now that they have greenhouses right at their, their campus, uh, they don't have to report anything. I would, I, that's my, my um, at, what I'm ascertaining out of the situation in, in this rule. Um, and uh, yeah, so very dangerous. They're not considering the contamination either of these plants out in the wild, you know, insulin or growth hormones on pollen that's getting out into the wild. Number nine, APHIS has determined that they have not seen evidence in the scientific literature that there are unique hazards that arise solely from the use of recombinant DNA techniques as compared with more conventional breeding, plant breeding techniques. So this means that they are ignoring the hundreds of studies showing harm from the consumption of genetically engineered foods in animals and clinical studies showing harmful impacts on cells and other studies showing the production of toxins such as formaldehyde, putrazine, and cadaverine by GMO plants. So they're just completely ignoring these studies, that there's anything different about GMOs. Um, you know, and by GMOs, I mean just the technique of the actual engineering, right? Like the, the effect of the engineering, um, uh, you know, that, that creates a unique hazard. They're, they're completely ignoring the entire aspect of genetically engineering a plant to withstand a pesticide, right? Or, or I mean, to withstand an herbicide or to have the pesticide built right in. I um, mean, the effects of that, and they claim that they can do that basically because it's the EPA's job to regulate the chemicals, even though it's the food's job to resist the chemicals or to include the chemicals, they don't, they don't care about that part. So that's not getting regulated. And we all know what kind of job the EPA is doing with regulating chemicals, right? It's horrible. So um, number 10, if APHIS does not respond to an applicant for an exemption for their GE products within 180 days, they <laughs> shall automatically be approved. So if the, if the um, applicants 
flood the USDA with applications for GMOs, I mean, after this, they're probably going to get hundreds of them, if not thousands of them, and the USDA doesn't respond to them in 180 days, they're all approved. It is a giant GMO free-for-all. And we know how efficient the government is. Yes, we know how efficient the government is. It takes six months for them to get back to me to do, when I apply for a Freedom of Information Act, right, for information about something. Six right. months. So it seems like so, we're at war on many fronts. We're being attacked with vaccines. We're being attacked with GMOs. We're being attacked with 5G. And they're suppressing facts and rewriting history on all of them. Yes, they are. And, and they are doing this as a giant gift to corporations, private corporations that want to make money, right? They want to make more money. I'm going to get to that. Okay, so uh, number 11, microbial pesticides, the new alternative to toxic chemicals, which are genetically altered microbes found in soil, fungi, and other, and other things like mold and, you know, um, fung yeah, fungus and mold are not to be regulated by APHIS. So all those microbial pesticides, US, the USDA is saying that that's not our responsibility. And my understanding is that the EPA is saying that it's not their responsibility either. So um, I'd have to, I need, I'm gonna get more information on that. But for sure, the USDA is saying that these microbial pesticides, even though they're sprayed on our food, right, or are used in our food, are not to be regulated. Oh, I forgot to include. This includes um, this includes uh, BT toxin. Did you guys, did you did you hear about that, Ann? I don't think I told you that last time. No. Yeah. So BT toxin, bacillus thuringiensis. Mm -hmm. No more regulation on that. It's the, the and bacillus thuringiensis was the original GMO. It's it's the toxin from the carcass of a dead grain caterpillar that was inserted into corn and it was genetically engineered to constantly reproduce more toxins. So when a corn rootworm bites the corn and eats it, it gets this bacillus therogenesis toxin that's then genetically engineered inside of its stomach, constantly produces more toxins, explodes the stomach, and the toxins get out into the system and it kills the bug. Now, they're not going to be regulating that anymore. Yeah. And they found that it does the same thing in humans, but oh well. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Um, all right. Number 12, APHIS acknowledges that GE crops contaminate organic crops. This is really upsetting. They also state that the cost for protecting the organic crops from contamination shall be resolved in the marketplace meaning that organic growers should recover that cost by charging consumers accordingly. Oh, come on. No, yeah. yeah. That's terrible. Yes, <laughs> that's terrible. They are saying basically you, the farmers, should pass on the cost to the consumers and charge them more money <laughs> because you have to have buffer zones and whatever, you know, plant trees to block the drift or whatever, we, you know, not sell 20% of your crop because it's contaminated by GMOs. And that's too bad, so sad, that's your problem and the consumers need to pay more money. And this is after we've already paid money for the GMO crop to be subsidized. You guys get that, right? Every single family, about $500 of your taxpayer dollars go toward, is subsidized and goes towards GMO crops to grow corn and soy and sugar. And most of that, those crops, by the way, the corn and soy are shipped overseas to feed, feed animals in Asia. Also so you're- too, Sorry to interrupt, Zen. Also yes. too, what I, what I thought was really interesting is about 60% of the soy corn uh, crops actually go to pharmaceuticals directly. They're grown to make the chemicals in the pharmaceuticals, which is something I never knew. 60% of the soy crops goes to pharmaceuticals? I've never heard that. Yeah, really? soy and corn. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I would love to know the source for that information. That would be yeah. great. Dr. Okay. Zach Bush, he's um, Dr. Zach Bush, he studies the microbiome. He's out of um, Encinitas and Boulder, Colorado, and also Virginia. He's like a regenerative agriculture farmer, triple Okay, board. yeah, yeah, no, I know him very well. I just, I would, I would like to get the source where he got that information from because I've, I've heard that 
it was more like 60 to 80 percent of soy and corn was used for animal feed and that animal feed is shipped to Japan and China and Europe and other places like that. Okay. Um, but I heard that on a podcast that he did. I, I can look it up. I'll find okay. it. Okay. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. I'd love to know what percentage is used for pharmaceuticals because that, that, that would just strengthen to our connections between pharmaceuticals and big ag, right? And, and what's going on there. Um, I know a large portion of it is also used for um, the eco fuel or, you know, the biodiesel. And so um, the majority of these GMO crops are not used for food. So that's the major point. They're not feeding the world as they claim to be doing. So um, we, we are paying more money, right? And, th and that biofuel and that animal feed is sold to other, you know, other countries and to corporations and they make money off of it. But we, the taxpayers that have subsidized the growing of that crop, we don't get any money back. You know, they say, oh, well, we'll mark it down and it's cheaper, you know, so you can buy a hamburger for 99 cents, but you have to pay $1.99 for um, a head of lettuce, you know, so I guess we're getting the benefit by having cheaper food, but if that cheaper food is giving us heart disease and 2,000 of us a day are dying from heart disease and uh, 1,700 a day are dying from cancer, then I don't think we're really benefiting. Okay, um, number 13, it all comes down to this. APHIS, the USDA states that the cost reduction of this new updated regulation shall save a GMO developing company on average in the scenario of producing 10 new GMO plants a, a year, $13.1 million. This is what it's all about. Saving each corporation $13.1 million. And there's only a handful of companies that are doing this, right? So let's just say it's saving the corporation $70 million. Is that really worth the health of our nation and the, 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 the lack of regulation? I mean, right now our, our nation is spending $1.3 trillion on healthcare. It's bankrupting our nation. So, um, yeah, so who, sh share the source for what? Can somebody, t um, Pow is asking, can you share the source for what? Um, or maybe you already got it from genetic literacy. I don't see genetic literacy as a valid source, whoever posted that. I just see them as a source of what's going on with the opposition, <laughs> but okay. Um, oh, the pharmaceuticals buying the GMO soy. Oh yeah, that's okay. So I've already asked um, whoever that was for the source of, of um, the GMO soy and corn going to, towards pharmaceuticals. That would be nice to have that source. Um, so, and Heather, can I get this link to the source of Monsanto's glyphosate just getting proved for another 13 years? Because that's news to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, we could have that source, that would be great. I, I heard also today talking to um, Dana Pearls from Friends of the Earth that Monsanto has proposed, or I guess it would be bare now, a new GMO that has five, it's stacked for five different pesticides. Wow. So not just one, but glyphosate, 2,4-D, dicamba, and two other pesticides. So they're going heavy, you know, they're not reducing um, so yeah, I'm going to post, um, Nicola, I'm going to post the link to my blog that I just gave you those 13 different points on our website on momsacrossamerica.org. I just want to, I just want to get a few things clarified. Like I had a question or two about a few things and I'm trying to get some scientists to get back to me, but it might take a, I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to post it today or not because, um, it's a 49 page document. It's a lot to ask somebody that already has a, another full-time job and some people aren't reading it as quickly um, as it would, you know, I'd like them to. So, so Frankie, you sent your kids to live in Europe. <laughs> so great. Yeah. You know, when I, when I went to visit, I went to Switzerland, it was like a dream come true to go to Switzerland. I got invited to go to Zurich to march in a parade because there was a tiny plot of GMO potatoes that was being trialed 
in a farm outside of a, in a, outside of a village near Zurich. And I'm not kidding you, y'all, 2,000 people, including 20 farmer tractors, like giant tractors, got together to do a protest. And it was because of this t one tiny GMO plot for potatoes. It was the first time GMOs had ever been planted in Switzerland. And um, the first trial for GMO potatoes, maybe not, all, maybe not all GMOs, but first time definitely for GMO potatoes. And, um, and the restriction on GMOs wasn't going to be lifted for two years. And they were still mad as hell. And so they did this um, giant protest and they invited people from Germany and France and Italy and um, all these different places. And they invited one of our GMO Mom, Moms Across America supporters had moved to Switzerland. And she told the organizer, you have to get Zen Honeycutt to come out. So they flew me out there, which was amazing. And I go to this little, you know, this plot in this farm and mar march through and um, I forgot my point now. <laughs> so sorry, what were we talking about before this? Um, oh, I know. And so I'm in Switzerland and we are having bread and cheese every single meal. And I do not get a rash. I don't get bloaty. I don't get a headache. I don't get sick. I, I feel completely fine. And, and yeah, the food in Switzerland and in most parts of Europe is, it's, a, it's amazing. And I walk from the farmhouse through this little village past a communal orchard like a whole hillside of trees that the community shares of plums and apples and all these things and go through into this little village where they have a um it's like a motel on top and then, then a, a, a community center on the bottom and then underneath there's a cheese cellar so you go down there it's like going into heaven it's this this cool, dark, you know, stone-walled cave with cheese in it from all of the cows in the, around the, the neighboring, you know, the, from the neighbors, and all the neighbors make their cheese in their unique way, and none of these cows are eating GMOs, none of them are getting growth hormones, you know, none of the corn is sprayed with, with uh, glyphosate, and it's all delicious and not harmful. So, um, all right, anyway, sorry it's to go out, digress on that little story there. But, um, and Nicole is asking, did you see the restaurant menus in Switzerland list all the countries of origin for each and every item of them? Uh, yeah, I remember, I, don't, I didn't go to that many restaurants because I ate, it was ate at somebody's home, but I saw in, when I looked at that little youth hostel place that had items on the menu, they mentioned like where the cheese came from and which neighbor and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. So they have a national goal to be food self-sufficient is what Frankie's saying. Yeah, so that leads me to the next thing that I want to share, which is um, positive and optimistic. And it's, it's really great. I just want to make sure you can see the title of this article and I'll scroll down. Um, because, you know, let's, let's face it, this news is really, really bad news for us. However, um, you know, we don't, we don't take anything lying down, right? We're, as I said earlier on my Facebook Live, we moms especially, we have been pooped on and peed on and puked on and punched and, and you know, like head butted and by our kids, you know, we, we have had, we've been woken up. It's been like Chinese torture, right? Being woken up in the middle of the night. Um, and we keep going, we keep get up, you know, and keep going. And we will continue to do that. So in keeping going, uh, we found this good news from Civil Eats that most farmers in the Great Plains don't grow fruits and vegetables. Uh, the pandemic is changing that. And this is talking about how more farmers are switching over and growing a variety of mixed vegetables. And this was a group of farmers in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. They hosted a remote agriculture happy hour you know, probably on Zoom, right? And they were um, more than a few dozen att uh, attendees. Everybody was wearing a cowboy hat. And they started talking about how they, they were switching over from talking about regular livestock crop cropping system. And they began to talk about how they were feeding their families and their communities that, you know, the lack of food. You know, these, these lines in some places in the Midwest are two or three hours long. 
people are waiting in line to get a box of food. And so they started talking about um, how are they getting their food and how fragile the food system is. And then they started talking about um, some solutions that they're doing. And this one guy, Tom Cannon, is planting six, ac six, ac say six acres of vegetables and he calls it chaos garden. And it's essentially a cover crop. But instead of just alfalfa or ryegrass, he's planting all kinds of things. He's plant planting peas and squash and radishes and okra and melons and sweet corn and all kinds of other plants. In other words, he says it contains groceries and he just plants them all over the field and they all grow willy nilly right next to each other. And, um, and it's like 50 plus species and he doesn't ever go back until it's time to harvest. He doesn't have to maintain it and weed it because the plants crowd out the other um, weeds, right? I think, you, I think you should um, contact him and tell him that he should rename it from chaos gardening to willy nilly gardening. <laughs> willy nilly gardening. <laughs> Well, yeah, there could be a better name than chaos gardening. I don't know, it's, it's something, but it, it's, I just think it's fabulous that they're using this, that using this, um, you know, all type of, yeah, willy nilly gardening, right? Just throwing <laughs> stuff all over. And he estimates that each acre of chaos generates 4,500 pounds of produce. How awesome is that? And it gets donated to the local community groups, the food banks, the youth groups, and, um, you know, gets rid of, of all kinds of weeds and it retains moisture. Of course, we know it sequesters more carbon. You know, the plants tend to mature at different rates. So, you know, you don't get as much of the crowding out as you would think. And it allows for several months of diverse bounty rather than a monocrop that gets culture, that gets harvested all at once, all at once. So, um, there it's he says it's like hunt and pick you gather as you go and you have to na navigate through the cover and it brings out the inner forager in everyone so you know what i love about this is that he's done the math and i'm going to get down here to the to the math um somebody calls this self-sufficient gardening mix milpa i don't know what borrowing from the word cultivated field okay from central mexico it's called milpa instead of chaos garden um, and it has all kinds of different um, crops and what he says is that I'm sorry let me get to the right part he says that um, if only one percent of commodity farmers switch to this milpa garden or chaos garden it will result in two million acres providing a 50% increase in national vegetable production and distributing it more evenly throughout the country. Wouldn't that be awesome if we could increase the mixed vegetable food um, accessibility, the, you know, the accessibility to food by 50%? That would be awesome. So we got to start a campaign. We got to do requests, you know, get out there, have people request that they're local commodity growers, even though there's, you know, they own like 10,000 acres at a time. So it's not gonna be that many neighbors that will be able to communicate this to them. But um, if the commodity growers switched over 1% of their acreage to mixed vegetables, we would have 50% more food, you know, in the form of vegetables across the nation. That's awesome. So I just want to, you know, put out there that there is good news that things can be done. Yes, it's a plentiful garden. Um, any idea how it compares with normal productivity? Well, the thing about normal productivity is that it's a monocrop. So it's just soy or it's just corn. And, and as we talked, discussed earlier, they're not feeding anybody with that. They might be shipping it off to Asia to feed the animals there, but they're most likely not feeding us with it. So all of this farmland, millions of acres of farmland that's being used in the United States and poisoned with toxic chemicals is not for our benefit. So if we truly were following what this president promotes, which is feed, which is America first, you would think that we would feed America first too, that we would switch over this farmland to organic vegetables. Here's the other thing, 80% of the soy that's used in organic 
food, like, you know, like um, impossible burgers, right? That's soy. 80% of the soy that's used, oh no, but sorry, impossible burger is not organic. Okay, so uh, a soy, organic soy burger or an organic uh, soy tempeh, right? Or any type of organic um, vegetarian or vegan food. 80% of the soy used in um, our organic vegan and vegetarian foods is imported. It comes from other countries. Does it make any sense when 60 to 70 or if not 80% of the GMO crops that we grow are exported? So again, if we were going to put America first, we would, we would switch over, grow organic soy or corn or organic mixed vegetables here, and we would feed America with our, you know, with our food. However, that creates a trade problem because if we're going to trade this, they have to trade that. We've got to have something to exchange. So the whole trading structure needs to adjust. If we're not going to be selling another country a whole bunch of corn and soy, but they're going to be selling us a bunch of toxic plastic toys, right? Then our trade deficit is off. We owe them more money than they are giving us. So we have to adjust our whole, you know, economy if we're going to become self-sufficient with food. And um, that whole trade issue is one of the reasons why America has pushed GMO farming so much because besides GMO farming, I believe the next commodity that we have is technology and entertainment. It's Hollywood, right? So we don't, we don't, we're not producing, we're not manufacturing a whole lot of things here anymore. I used to be a fashion designer, <laughs> honestly. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but I used to be a fashion designer and I lived in, I worked in New York City and I did that for about seven years. I used to work in Hong Kong and London and, you know, different places. Um, but first I worked just in New York and we used to take the garments and bring them to Chinatown and they would make the samples right in New York. And then they would produce, you know, first the samples and then they would produce them. And then one day, all of a sudden they said, no, nope, we're going to ship it off to China. You're going to put in a FedEx box. And they're going to make the sample in China. Then they're going to fed back, FedEx back the sample. You're going to prove it. And then um, we're going to have all the fabric, which is now it's no longer being made in Virginia. It's being made in Hong Kong. And the fabric is going to go to the plant there. You're going to see a sample. You're never going to see the whole rolls. You're just going to see a swatch. And all of the fabric and all of the production is going to be done in China. And my Rolodex went completely, you know, uh, obsolete in a matter of about a year and a half. Well, we, we send our chicken, we, we send their chickens over to China to be processed yeah. to send back here. Yeah, then because, because our, our, because our uh, corporations won't pay people enough in order to keep the jobs here. And, and China will pay people so little that it takes the money over that, you know, the dollar, I'm not a, I'm not a financial person at all. I don't know why I'm talking about this so much. But I just wanted to share, I have personal experience with jobs going like that, like fabric manufacturers closed in Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and Connecticut just closed in a matter of like a year or two. And the, and the sample making going all the way over to Asia instead of being produced right in the same city that I lived in. And it was completely changed in a matter of a couple of years. And um, that happened in the in the 90s. I don't know who was president then, but whoever it was deregulated everything. I think it was Clinton, right? Yes, Max. I would venture to guess that the same people who were hiring the people in Virginia or wherever to do it, are the same people who are sending it to China to be done because it's more economically profitable. Oh yeah, no, th so, so those companies probably sent it over there to be manufactured over there. But meanwhile, all those jobs were gone here or they simply sold their company. They said, yeah, go ahead and buy it, right? Like we'll give you the, the, the um, technology to make that fabric over there and we'll sell it off to you, you know? But whatever the case was, those factories were shut down. Those contacts were no longer, I couldn't get the, the samples from them any longer, you know, the fabric or, the, or, or produce the clothing from them any longer. So um, everything, changed and because of that we don't have things like we, we don't have clothes or fabric to export to other countries so there's no balance yes frank 
But so what what you are describing though is they're driving us, we're not driving them. And that's the difference between us and a lot of the Scandinavian countries, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, <clears throat> those people take really deep pride in products that are manufactured and designed in their country, yes. right? So we're not demanding it. So that this economic conversation is extremely important because if, if tomorrow everybody in the United States that ate organic decided when we go to the grocery store, we're not going to buy any soy products unless it's labeled with country of origin, those companies would figure this out really quickly. Yeah. But we don't do that. We're, we, we spend all of our time complaining to our representatives of what we want and the representatives read what we say and then two minutes later they're paid off and they forget what we say. So I don't know if anybody remembers, but when President Trump was elected, he called upon Robert Kennedy Jr. to head up the task force on immunization, which we all thought, this is great. Who yeah. could be better, right? So he did the right thing. But does anybody know what happened to Robert Kennedy in that position? Yes, why don't you tell us, you know. A pharmaceutical came in and donated a million dollars to the Trump campaign. Pfizer. And Trump replaced Kennedy with a, um, a, a, um, an employee from the pharmaceutical. Yes. So we have to take, and I know you guys hate it when I keep harping on this, but we have to take an economic approach. Us going to our representatives or thinking we can fix this at the polls is a useless effort because they just get deeper and deeper entrenched. What's going on right now between the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Anthony Fauci, the CDC, and what they want to do with vaccines, it is all driven by economics. It is all driven by money. And yeah. if we don't combat this on their turf, which is the economic turf, we're just going to be ignored. They're going to roll over us like they have been doing for Ever. Yes, I absolutely agree. And that's why we've chosen to focus on moms who buy 85% of the food. I believe that we have the most power. Right. And so my point is, so my point is, let's take those moms and give them instructions so that we all do the same thing with mm -hmm. our dollar bills every time we go to the store. I watched, an, I watched a video the other day. It was an interview with a, a cattle rancher. And this guy, did, did you see it, Max? This, well, he, yeah, where well, he has his, uh, yeah, I think I might have seen the same one. He was beside himself. You have no idea what's going on in cattle ranching right now. There's four major meat processors in the United States. The cattle ranchers can't do anything with their stock because these processors are shut down. And the processors wield so much power that the cattle ranchers have to abide to everything they say, which includes what they get to sell their cattle at. But so it's, it's terrible. There, and there he is said, a reversal in that going on though. There are farmers who are now raising organic cattle through the, through the internet. There was uh, something about that that was on a couple of days ago where this farmer with hundreds or thousands of acres was explaining how he's going regenerative and he's reprocessing his old supply chain instead of distributing it to distributors, he's just going online and selling it to people. No, I, I agree with you. That's a solution. But my point is we as consumers, we have to focus right. on the vendors that are doing the right thing. And we yes. have to force the ones that aren't doing the right thing to either board up and shut up or give us what we want. I don't think there's really any other way. I am beside myself every time I watch the news today. It's, it's just driving me insane with what they're getting away with. And we, and we just sit back and we take it. In many areas, the whole vaccine industry is a fraud and which is going crazy 
And all the money that we pay for pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines should be the whole medical industry. Doctors have to be re-educated to heal people rather than to treat disease. Exactly. And the whole alternative medicine industry has to become mainstream medicine. And I, and I don't know if you're noticing this, but a lot of these very well-respected holistic doctors, these are MDs, medical doctors that are practicing holistically, right? They have a, they have a, they have, you know, they're, they're doctors of medicine, not, not, um, what do they call it? Not, uh, medical doctors. Yeah. They're, they're, they're medical doctors. They're not, um, I, I can't think of the word of it right now, but their, their, their Facebook pages are being taken down. Their websites are being shut down. Their YouTube channels are being turned off. I'm not it's, surprised. it's, it's crazy. These I are doctors I've been following for years. I think our, Unfortunately, these ideas are great, and um, we have tried this. I think our biggest problem right now is, is one, one is kind of apathy. People, and, and people are being controlled by the mainstream media. I mean, I, I literally, my brother moved in with me in January, and when this whole COVID-19 thing started, I literally walked into the living room one day and screamed at the top of my lungs to turn off the mainstream media because he was starting to freak out. I've now turned him and he's now seeing the light, but I, apathy, apathy and people, they just don't wanna believe that there's anything wrong, and so. Well, nobody wants to believe that there's anything wrong and, and nobody wants to, nobody really wants to do something about it because we wanna be comfortable, right? It is in our human nature to be comfortable and anything that challenges that comfort the little voice in our head, the committee in our head is going to resist it. And um, what, what, what we, there's a lot of things that we can do. And I, I want to share um, one thing that we're proposing. And, but I appreciate that you're saying that we need to educate the moms and support them in doing the right thing and buying the right types of food. And we've been doing that for seven years. We've been marching in Fourth of July parades. We've, we reach over 1.5 million people on Facebook now. Um, awesome. we, have had our, we have had our reach curbed extensively by Facebook censorship. And, um, and I want to you know, make sure that people know that, um, that us addressing the vaccine issue dramatically impacted our reach as far as the GMO issue goes. So it, it, did, it was a choice that we made consciously, though, however, because our supporters are impacted by vaccines as just as much as the food issue. And we knew it would impact our funding. We knew it would impact our reach, but it was, it would be out of integrity for us to do it any other way. So we could be reaching hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people more, probably millions of people more, but that has been curbed. So we, we why, are- Why did you say it's been curbed? I don't understand because that. Because of the vaccine- um, the Algorithms. The algorithms and anybody who posts about, about vaccines, their algorithms drop. Huh. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the searchability of your page, our website was threatened several times to be shut off because of things about vaccines. And also, by the way, because- When did, of, when did all that happen? Um, right around the time when Adam Schiff started getting Amazon to take off vaccine stuff off of Amazon, the books that have been removed off of what, Amazon about the vaccines. What, when was that? What date? That was in August of last summer. Yeah. So our, our reach dramatically dropped. Um, but also, I have to say it was before then, yeah. even a couple of years ago, even a couple of years ago, when we first started Moms Across America, we had, we had 3,000 likes that first couple of months. And we had a reach on Facebook of over 300,000 a week because we had 3,000 likes. Now we have 60,000 likes. And we're still only reaching 1.5 million, which is what a little bit more than 300,000 a week. It's like maybe 500,000 a week or 700,000 a week, something like that. So this is, and this is seven years later, we should have hundreds of thousands of people on Facebook, right? Reaching millions of people a week. Um, but the algorithms have been adjusted such that only 7% of the people that have liked our page actually see our posts. And that's only if you actually click on get notifications and then you actually comment. If you stop commenting, if you don't comment on Moms Across America posts, you're not going to see them after a while. 
and eventually Facebook will remove you from the number of people who have liked our, our, our um, page. So our likes will go up to maybe 67,000, but along the way, there's been three or 4,000 people eliminated because they haven't liked our or commented our page on for six months. It's, it's an automatic weeding process. They actually remove people that have liked your page if they don't participate. So, um, so we we're, I'm not going to explain all of the different obstacles that we've come up against, but I do want to, I do want to share with you that we are doing everything we possibly can. We're actually fundraising right now too, for a program called one click, which will enable, enable us to um, not only retain the emails of people that sign petitions so that we can then connect those people together to work together in local communities, but we can also, um, more effectively reach the targets of the people that we're targeting. There's like a 98% open rate. So it's better technology for petitions and letters and all of that kind of stuff. And is one but, click an app? Is this an app it's a program? Yeah, it's a program. And um, a lot of other nonprofits use it and it's much more efficient for signing petitions and targeting people and, um, and nonprofits can buy it at a discounted rate. So, you know, we're working on raising money for that. We're about halfway there. We're raising the money to be Because I was almost, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. The other day, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge networker in the technology space because that's kind of where I sit. Um, a guy was offering app development to worthy nonprofits for free. Okay, and well, he was, I'm interested. <laughs> You guys could definitely use an app because that yes. would put you in direct connection with all of your followers and you wouldn't have to worry about, I mean, I'm not going to say that you'd still have to worry about the carriers Verizon and because they have the ability to filter and route your messages, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to connect you with this guy. Yeah. Connect me because what I'm about to talk about with this moms across America cooperatives, I'm wondering if this shouldn't be an app instead. Okay, go ahead. Let's okay. hear it. So these Moms Across America cooperatives, by the way, we're not calling them chapters because we don't, a chapter seems more exclusive. We want them to be cooperative in order to work with other people. So this, this idea is a local group. So let's just say it would be um, a uh, Milwaukee, Moms, Milwaukee Moms Across America co-op or M Milwaukee Moms co-op. And it would, it would be a co-op that would meet once a week or have an event once a week. And eventually when we can get out in the real world, right now it would just be on Zoom. But um, say if Ann was the head of it, she would invite like maybe her friend, Will Allen is a local farmer to speak on fr this coming Friday. And that would be the meeting for this week on Zoom. And then at that meeting, she would ask somebody who wants to get a speaker or who wants to speak for the next Friday. And somebody could say, well, I know how to make sauerkraut and it could be awesome. That's the meeting for next week. Somebody, she could also say, um, who wants to be the person to gather the local food sources in our community? And somebody could say, oh my God, I know, you know, three different farmers or my father knows five farmers. I'll start getting a list together. So that person is in charge of getting the list together of all the local farmers where you can um, purchase local food. One guy did this on Facebook and he started a shop Kansas farmers Facebook page. And in one day he had 4,500 people from across Kansas on that Facebook page. And it was farmers and consumers that wanted to support local farmers so that they didn't go out of business, right? Because of this whole COVID thing. So somebody in the group could be in charge of connecting the local farmers, right? With their members to support them and, you know, the CSAs and local farmers. And then she could say, somebody else who wants to be the 5G person, right? So they're, they're like, okay, I'll go to the city council meetings and I'll give you the updates on 5G and I'll rally everybody. Okay, so who wants to be the person who wants to be in charge of like finding out what's going on with vector control? Because each city is, it has a threat of being sprayed with mosquito spray, right? And that can only be handled locally. You guys can contact me all you want at Moms Across America nationally to do something about this. I can't do that. I can't go to your vector control meeting and stop the spraying of your city with NALID. It has to be people locally in your community to get involved to do that. And if you start a Moms Across America co-op, you can get that group of people that will show up at the vector control meeting or that will show up at the city council meeting and talk about 5G or that will show up and start a community garden at your local school right? That these, this is your core group of people 
that will support others or there's you know six people or ten people that's your core group of people and then you share with other people and on certain days once a month maybe 40 people will show up right but you start growing that local group to address the local issues and the mission you, you, we have our mission here and our values and the the intention is to invite involvement in actions that can bring health and freedom to our community so we uh, sorry i should have in here inform to inform right the the local residents and invite them to participate and get involved in actions that support the local community and the idea is that the cooperative would be like a health advocate potluck party right and inviting farmers to the table as well the local farmers so that you're um you're getting involved and so we have suggestions here for like week one form your group pick your initial issue it might be 5g for you or it might be um uh, health freedom or health issues whatever that is and each person will have the thing that they're is nearest and dearest to their heart and then they might also start that um group to you know take back your local food system and looking up things like farms that are delivering.com and csas and farmers markets and things like that and then the next week you would create a zoom meeting to get together with people and um have you know for instance maybe you would create a facebook page with something like this bringing health advocates to the table toxins free health you know freedom emfs um or sorry that would be in the first week create your create your group and create a zoom meeting and then week two would be to have the call and either create a drop off or a pickup time if somebody has arranged with local farmers or at least just start discussing it when you might do that and um create a, a, a facebook group to start gathering and you know so we have suggestions here on what to do each week and we have basic agreements um which is basically to sum them up be nice and work together nicely you know like moms would like you to do and then we have um suggestions for you know books to read and membership and you know things like that so this is what i believe needs to happen locally for us to get organized and support each other in local regions however i'm seeing not that great of a response i mean first of all it's COVID and everybody shut down and people aren't able to get together right but i also see that people may not want to start something new right now there might be some like fatigue and you know stuff going on so what i'm wondering is you know how next door is an app you guys if you guys see next door mm -hmm. so it's an app for local community so you have to put in your address and in order to get accepted in your local community um you 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 know you it's for so it's only for your local community you can only connect locally um however on next door whenever i post anything about 5g and i'm not on my soapbox i'm just saying hey guys there's a meeting at the city council you know on, on this date and that date and if you want to find out more more about 5g go to it or if you want to boost your immune system you may want to try turning off your wi-fi and getting hardwired because 5g can weaken your immune system i got kicked out of next door for that because that was apparently being on my soapbox right so what if we had an app where you didn't get kicked out for talking about you know chemicals being sprayed over your city because of mosquitoes or because 5g weakens your immune system what if it was an app for your local neighborhood that was focused on health issues right i think that's what we need i think we need a moms across america app where you can connect with your local neighbors and it's focused on the health and safety of the community can I can I just add something to them? Hi everyone, I'm Heather. I've been. Hi Heather. This is this is my first time. I actually went to. I'm in Costa Mesa in Southern California, and I went to our um, you know county meet, city meeting whatever on on the 5G issue, and they specifically had their lawyer for the um, FCC. It was supposed to be a two hour period, and I did the same thing. I was like, everybody come with me. Let's carpool. Let's go. Nobody came. I went by myself. Um, so I waddled in there like eight months pregnant and just kind of like plopped down in the front. I was like, all right, I'm here for the babies. Um, but they, um, they had the lawyer and they had a two hour period. First hour was to just have this guy explain, you know, the non danger of it all. And then the next hour was supposed to be for people to like give their comments and feedback. 
he spoke for an hour and 45 minutes slowly and purposefully so that nobody even got to deliver their comments. Um, I later called up a few of the, the female, um, you know, city council members just to try to like connect as a mom. And he basically said, you know, the real people who are at risk are, um, are men because they have more body mass and we absorb more that he wouldn't call it radiation. He kept calling it RF frequency. He said, Oh, the men absorb all the RF frequency. So it's really on us. Ha 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 ha. And I, I just stood up and I said, actually, kids have more, you know, water in their cells. They're the ones who are going to be absorbing more of the radiation. And I got kicked out. They fully escorted me out. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you do an outburst, I almost got kicked out because I went to one of the Costa Mesa meetings. Might have been the one, at, one of them after you. And they were reading through the ordinance. You know, you have to do two readings through it successfully before in order for it to be enacted and they were doing the first reading um and it talked about how there was a hundred foot setback for public art and and i was like wait a second because we had just gone through this whole thing about daycare centers and how there was a 35 foot setback for homes and so somebody asked well what about schools because schools were going to get a hundred foot setback but they said, well, does that include daycare centers? And they said, yeah. And they said, well, then what about a daycare center in a home? And she said, well, we already determined that. And so that means it's going to stay at 35 foot setback for a daycare center in a home. So I said, excuse me, does that mean public art gets a bigger setback, a hundred foot setback versus a two-year-old in a, in a daycare? And they're like, that's a, that's a public outburst. Get the policeman. Like, you know, like it was, and, you know, and, and at first they were like, well, where does it say that? And I said, right there in the doc, look, a hundred foot setback for public art. And you're giving only a 35 foot setback for daycare centers and, and homes. And their brows furrowed up. And, you know, um, I don't think they changed it. I think they passed it the next meeting, um, you know, just keeping it that way. And um, so, yes, you do. We have to be vigilant. And that's why we need groups like this, because one woman I met was from Lake Forest and she, she came to this, to the Costa Mesa meeting and she said, it's too late in my city. They already passed with 25 foot setback from homes. She's like, cause I didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. Nobody, nobody's connecting. Nobody's talking about this stuff. We, we're, we don't know our neighbors. We don't know that this is happening. So we, it, the, the solution to all of this really is to find out who your neighbors are and get connected locally. And I know right now we can't like, have a block party, but we could get on apps and very carefully on next door, start connecting with people and um, start having Zoom calls. I know one of our board members, Lauren up in Washington, she has um, Zoom eats or Zoom cooks party. And she's, she's got like 50 something people that come on Zoom parties and they cook together. Like we could be doing that you could do that locally and you know like what we're doing right now this is people all across the country there's people here from michigan and washington and virginia and california thank you very much for being on but we need you to do this in your local town and invite local people on a call and get connected and talk about these issues can you guys do you guys think you can do that do you guys think you can do a zoom call locally do you think you could post on next door or on facebook and start does that sound like really scary to you or like, so what's the block? What's, what would be a block for you in doing that? Like, I, like I can't do that. Well, I'd be Am willing I? to try, but I kind of don't think it would go anywhere. They did the, like the whole structure of social media, it kind of like everybody being blocked and limiting it, it's designed to prevent just like uh, mass media, the, the, the networks are all, having their own message and our message is kind of not being getting out there. Right. Okay. So it's possible that social media won't allow us to reach as many people as we'd like, but if you start it, right, if you start a Facebook page, you don't have to start mom's co-op, right? It could be, what's the name of your town, Max? Bushkill. Bushkill. Pike County or. Bushkill or County. Pocono. People United, whatever. It could be, you know, it could be one person started Unstoppable Parents of Westchester, Virginia, right? Because she wanted parents to be involved. Mad Max of Bushkill. <laughs> I've been that before. Yeah, so whatever it is that you want to start, Max, it doesn't have to be a Moms Across America thing, but um, 
you, so yeah, Lindsay's saying she just started a Facebook page, Spoking Wired. Oh, that's good. Very good. Wired, right? So you're talking about the positive things about halting 5G, right? And getting hardwired. And some people start, um, like, for instance, um, Laguna Niguel Citizens for Safe Technology, right? You could say Laguna Niguel Citizens for a Safe City, right? And so that would be more encompassing, not just, in not just technology, but chemicals and food supply or whatever, right? Whatever it is that you want to start, start some, something. There's a Lisa from Moms Across America supporter, like from six years ago, started Empowered People of Menifee. Awesome, right? Like good name. So start whatever it is that, that you, you want to start um, and mm -hmm. then ask people, you know, start posting. You got to post a couple times a day, something new, share something and then say, hey guys, do a post next week at Friday at seven o'clock or five o'clock, whatever. We're going to have a live Zoom meet. We're going to do a, a live, uh, sorry, a Zoom or a live Facebook live together at a certain time. And, um, and you can start just by doing a live, a live Facebook Live without a planned thing and just ta start talking to people. But just start getting people together. And then the really important thing is to start getting emails because if your group does get shut down, I mean, it's not gonna get shut down when you have 50 people. Like my Mission Viejo group only has 50 people so far. But um, when, if you get to like the UK 5G group that's 60,000 people because they got violent, they got shut down. The whole page went black. So you've got to get emails if you're going to do that, right? Um, you actually have to get phone numbers too. Yeah, and phone number. Yeah, you because, because get... your emails your emails won't get delivered once once they figure out who you are. Your emails will end up in a spam bucket. They could, yeah, or just not read. Yeah. So so Frankie's asking, you know how libraries do public interest seminars? My son tried to do a seminar in GMO. As the library banned his speech because he didn't have opposing opinion. I don't recall opposing opinion in opera of finance. You're so funny. You're right. We got so angry that we left another library for some 10 years. Yeah, some libraries will just not, it depends on the public forum, right? But that's why Zoom is good because nobody's going to censor your Zoom. You might get bombed by some trolls, but you, nobody's going to regulate that. Um, Are you concerned at all about like the recording aspect to it though? Um. Well, so here, here's what I think about recording and even working on Gmail. I work on Google Docs all the time. Pretty much everything I do, I want to be out in the public and I want it to be shared. And my Facebook post too. So I don't give a fig if the government is watching what I do. And, and frankly, I don't care if the government's watching where I go because I'm not going anywhere embarrassing. I'm going to, <laughs> I mean, now I'm staying home. But when, I, you know, when I'm around, I'm traveling to an airport. I'm going somewhere. Like I really... And if they're going to come after me because I'm an activist, then they're going to come after me. I can't stop that. I'm not doing anything illegal, so I don't care if they're watching me. I would like it for them to be watching pedophiles. That would be, I would approve of that. So, um, you know, so all of this tracking stuff doesn't get me, it doesn't get me anxious. I, because I personally am not super freaked out about that. I feel the same way. I'm basically great on. If they're watching you, I hope they're hearing your message. Right. Yeah. The other thing is, is that if they are tracking me and they're watching what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, they're aware of what I'm saying. And I want the government to be aware of what I'm saying anyway, because they're screwing up and they need to fix it. <laughs> they need to be aware. That's why I gave that letter to Hotez, right? It was like, look, here's what needs to be fixed. You know, you need to know this, right? So yes, Lori. Um, you know, I'm in holistic health, so I'm in therapy now because we've lost 63 um, holistic health doctors and stuff, and um, I wanted to confirm it, so I was going to a behavioral therapist, and he confirmed it. You know, he said, and my emails were getting broken into like three years ago, then my, all my emails were going into the um, drafts for some reason, and I don't even do any type of like, you know, I don't write books, I don't do anything. I sent some stuff to our law enforcement when I was like, I was, got really sick a couple of years ago and I've been on a natural therapy, but I was going to tell you, I got two towers that went up at our target and cub and I was there the other day and I got a bloody nose. So I'm immunocompromised and I can feel it. I, I mean, the other day I felt like a pressure in my head and in my ear and I'm not around that stuff where I live. And so when I went to the stores, I couldn't believe it. And my, 
my kid who's vaccine damaged a little bit, she's 22 now, she was in town from Florida and she went there and she got a bloody nose. Okay, bye-bye. So. I'm um, so sorry. It's, it's our, happening all across the country now and we're getting. Uh, it's we COVID-19. Well, we're getting, we're getting calls um, from people across the country where a poll was put up, you know, thousand feet away from them, 65 feet away from them. They're getting headaches, tinnitus, um, fatigue, uh, increased, you know, sickness, you know, colds and runny noses and all that because it, it breaks down the immune system. And one guy, um, Andrew Campanelli, a lawyer, I've shared this a couple of times, I'll share it again. A man in a um, apartment building, you know, wealthy businessman, a poll was put up and it was across from his apartment because it's 30 feet up. And um, within two weeks, he went deaf in the ear that faces the pole that where he was sleeping. And um, another apartment building, a whole group of residents in that apartment building that never knew each other because in new york you don't get to know your neighbors because they could be crazy and you don't want to invite crazy into your life right so you don't know your neighbors um but they somebody eventually spoke to somebody because they had a headache or whatever and they all found out that they were all sick at the same time and they all went to their doctors and reported the same issues at the same time so this lawyer is now seriously considering taking on health issues related to 5G. So if you have symptoms, I beg you to record them, to keep a handwritten notebook with dates and times and symptoms and use that as fodder for a lawsuit. And don't think that because you don't have money, you can't file a lawsuit. Don't ever let money stop you from doing anything. If I had Moms Across America would not exist and millions of people would not be getting this information, right? My husband told me, you can't put one dime from our budget into that because we don't have it. <laughs> so I had to go out and ask for it. So I did. I asked for it and got a website together, got $2,000 from a non-GMO seed supplier, built the website and off we went, right? So don't ever let money stop you. And if you need to sue somebody, there are people out there, there are billionaires out there that have small cell facilities being put up outside of their home and they can't sue because they don't have health issues only certain people get health issues right away from this, right? And so we, are there, we know actually lawyers that have cases where they need people to, to be the plaintiffs. So if you wanna sue, please let us know. We will connect you with a lawyer. We have a new page up on our website called Lawyer Up. And um, what, where is that under? Is it under, um, I never know, we have so, it's under action lawyer up. So if you need a lawyer, we are putting lawyers now up there on your page. Call, call them, contact them. It may cost a lot less than what you think. And you could always raise money um, for a lawsuit and to protect your city from 5G going in, by the way, by doing a fundraiser on GoFundMe. Sacramento has done this. Uh, Islands in Hawaii have done it. Many places have um, raised money through GoFundMe for lawyers. So uh, please don't let money stop you. Okay. And we do need, by the way, um, uh, we're looking for a plaintiff in Northern California. So if anybody knows anybody in Northern California with electromagnetic sensitivity, um, we need a plaintiff for a lawsuit. And these lawsuits could change everything for everybody, right? All we need is one lawsuit to win and it's going down. Hey, so, Ann? Yes. Um, I want to go backtrack this a little bit before you went off on this about Keep getting people to talk, you know, talk to these groups and what would be holding them back. Yes. And um, when I ended up going to Monsanto for the first time and people, you know, they told me to, you know, punch you Grant in the face and do this and do that. And I said, well, I'm really not, I'm there to get thrown out, number one. And they, and then somebody said, well, you know, they're not going to listen to you. I said, yeah, but there were a thousand shareholders at that meeting. Those are the ones I was talking to. So you never know. Yes. One person, you get their wheels turning, could turn into a whole movement. Yes. So Please. Max, let's just say you do start a Facebook page and somebody said they, they invited a whole bunch of people and nobody showed up. So that was one time, right? And, and what you can learn from that is what do I need to do better next time? Maybe I didn't give people enough advance notice. Maybe I didn't ask enough, enough people. Maybe if I only have um, six people on my Facebook page, Maybe I need to reach out to them and individually message them and say, hey, could you invite 10 people to join our group, right? Or 
could you, could you be on the next meeting and could you share something about, like, could you call the city council and ask them when's the next hearing? Give them a job to do and then they have to be on the next call because they're responsible for reporting it, right? You may give them some ownership over, over the meeting, right? Would you be the person to call the city council, find out when the next hearing is, or could you be the person to find out, do we have an ordinance? Ask them to do one thing and then bring that back to the group and then they will be responsible for sharing that and give people you know, a, an opportunity to, to make a difference. So don't give up, keep trying and, and keep letting go of this idea that um, nobody's gonna come and you know, you're the only one. Cause here's the thing, if you don't try, you are gonna be the only one. If you don't invite people, you are going to be the only one. But if you say, hey, guys, I need help, and can you help me, then people will start responding, and they'll start coming. What I have to do is figure out how to reach like-minded individuals, because most of the people that I meet on a personal level and try to talk to all consider me a crazy conspiracy theorist, and they, they're following the government's agenda. They are waiting to be vaccinated. Yeah. So, so, so that happens. And, um, and, and everybody will have an opinion about people, what they look like and how they talk. And so you wanna get people in your group that look differently and talk differently because somebody, Max, might not relate to you because you have white hair and you, they might think you look like a crazy person, right? Um, other people might relate to a mom looking somebody like Pam. Oh, she looks safe and you know, friendly and you know, like a, a sweet mom, right? So you want to get different people or somebody might relate to Frank is like, oh, he's a dude. He's a man's man. I'm going to listen to that guy, whatever. Right. Like people relate to different people because of how they look and how they talk. And that's why we want to have a combination of different kinds of people in our group. And we want to have that ask all of them to reach out and to connect with people. And we don't just want like minded people. We want people that think about different things in different ways and that might be concerned about it. Like you might have somebody in your group that is totally focused on you know, vaccines, but is just such, kind of interested in this 5G group thing. And so you ask them to be a part of the group and look up one thing and start get, you know, involved. And, um, and, and you wanna welcome different people with different opinions, okay? And, and really don't require people to think the same way that you do. Don't make them wrong, don't yell at them. Um, you know, just be like, yeah, that's an important issue too. And, um, you know, we, we want to, you know, bring everybody together, right? Oh, and thank you, Frank, for, for pointing out the 5G crisis online is June 1st. It's the 5gsummit.com. And it's, wow, it's 623. It's so light out, I didn't even realize that so much time was passing. So uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, I'm honored to be considered anybody's hero. I am really just doing what I see needs to be done. <laughs> That's it. I am. I'm convinced and compelled and committed to, you know, keep going and make progress in this world. And, uh, and I feel very blessed to be able to do what I'm doing. And I'm really grateful that you're on the call and uh, that everybody's on the call um, because it gives me hope, you know, like a lot, I, I'm working from home. And so often I think, you know, I'm, I'm the only one working on it. Like with Mission Viejo, I mean, I'm running the national organization, right? A, nonprofit with no background in doing it. I told you earlier, I was a fashion designer, an entrepreneur. Nope, I have no background in doing this, but I'm running this nonprofit. And then I realized that nobody else in my town is doing anything about 5G. So I'm like, really? Oh my God, I got to be the one to start this Facebook group and get it going. But look, we're doing pretty awesome. The first meeting was in February and nothing has happened since. Next meeting is in June. It's been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Thank goodness to the COVID thing too. It's also helped. So um, we just keep getting things delayed and we're going to just hopefully keep doing that, right? Okay, so Susie's asking, have we shared about the Americans for Responsible Technology CTA regarding video submissions? Oh, no, we haven't. Thank you so much. So the Americans for Responsible Technology, I think you can also go to 5gcrisis.com. They have a request for video submissions saying something like, you know, I don't want 5G not, or whatever. Not here, not my children. I, I did it. I had my brother do it. Yeah. Okay, so there's a video that they want. Thank you, Susie, for mentioning that. They extended the deadline until Friday because they need more video submissions. Um, so uh, we'll share, we'll make sure to share a link on that too. Um, 
And yeah, and don't forget, you don't have to look pretty, but you do have to have nice lighting. Make sure you're facing a window instead of having the window behind you. That doesn't work, okay? Try to have natural lighting rather than a yellow light from a regular thing. You, you do need to have, to have nice lighting and, and decent sound. Um, okay, yeah, and they have scripts on your site, so you don't have to worry about saying anything. The only thing I request that you do is don't be nervous. Just, just be natural and look right at the camera. Don't look down and, you know, just look at the camera, have decent lighting and say what you need to say. And don't worry about what you look like and all that stuff. Nobody cares. Nobody ever cares what anybody looks like. What they care about is what you're saying and who you're being about it. If you're being authentic, if you're being real, then they will feel it. Okay. It'll be impactful. Yeah. Be spontaneous. Great. Okay. Um, it was really great to connect with you all. Next Monday is Memorial Day, so we're probably not going to be on. We, I don't think we're really like taking a vacation or anything, but um, we probably won't be on. I'll, I'll send a notification out. We usually don't do Moms Connect calls on, on holidays. Um, and somebody's asking me to contact Carol. What? Um, uh, so for in Encinitas, who has win women's wisdom groups. Okay, let me just contact that. Okay. Um, you can always have people email me at zen at momsacrossamerica.com if you have contacts that you want to connect with me. So Frank, you're going to connect me with somebody, zen at momsacrossamerica.org. Yep. I'm not enough of a phone number for you to contact her. Oh, yeah. Somebody is missing part of the phone number. Thank you. Good eye, Max. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your time. I appreciate it very much. It was good to be with you. Take care. Thank Keep you. going. Be unstoppable. Don't give up. Take care.